So in order to better understand how, how we do that, we have to think about what are the building blocks of an image. So pixels, we, we often hear the word pixel, but I don't know if all of us really know what it is. It's the most basic unit of an image that we see on a computer, or that's printed, or it's on a, um, or on a television screen. So we see, an, in a grayscale image, any combination of very light to very dark pixels. So you can have as many as 256 brightness values per pixel in an image. And then on top of that, complicating things, when you add color, you can have, I, I won't go into the details as to why, um, but we can realize that a green and a red and a blue makes up every pixel. So any combination of values between 1 and 256 for green, 1 and 256 for red, and 1 and 256 for blue will make a unique color which equals 16.7 million color combinations. That's why we can see such an array of colors. So how can we know if our pictures are color balanced? Well again, we can look and see if it looks like it's the true color. Or we can include in our pictures things that have defined values for colors, things that have defined values for exposure, so we don't have to guess. We know based on the number values the numbers between 1 and 256, what that color should be when we look at it in the image processing software. So we try to capture in all of our pictures something like this, what we call a color checker that has color aim points. It has aim points between white and black, which allow us to adjust the, the um, white balance. And it has all of these colors. And for each one of these squares, there's a number for red, green, and blue. So if I move my mouse over this square, I should see the numbers 243 for red, 243 for green, 242 for blue. So there's no guesswork. The numbers are there. And if any one of these doesn't read the value that I expect to see here, then I need to adjust to make sure that it's color balanced. <coughs> that said, it's also really important if you can to try and calibrate your monitor. So most of the monitors, when they come out of the box, they have factory settings and they may not, um, they may not display the true colors of the picture that we're seeing, for example, or whatever it is, the object that we're seeing. Some may have a blue cast, some may have a red cast. So in order to adjust for that and be able to see the true colors as the, the camera captures it, or as we, as we want the camera to capture, there's, there are pieces of software that allow you to place a little monitor here on your screen and the, the square behind the little monitor will flash through all the colors that the monitor can display and looking at those it'll, it'll read the values of red, green and blue for each one of those and determine how it needs to adjust your monitor to display the colors as they should be displayed. So I recommend those. They're not necessary, like I said, because the numbers don't lie, but it sure makes for pleasant work because then you really get to see the, the, the outcome of your hard work. And then finally, we, we really uh, need to make sure that all of our specimen images have readable text. So if we take a picture of our specimen from 10 feet away, it may be in focus, it may be well exposed, and it may be color balanced, but we can't read the label. So we need to try and, and optimize the space on our camera sensor to capture the specimen and as much of the specimen as possible and nothing else. We want to try and eliminate the need to crop and in so doing we'll have labels that are readable and hopefully we'll have plant parts that are taxonomically informative. So how do we do that? Part of that has to do with the type of image we capture, the quality of the camera that we use or the, the number of megapixels. So we talked about pixels before well, pixels are related to spatial resolution or, or the crispness of a picture. So the spatial resolution is measured in pixels per inch. You've probably seen this before. And then the pixel dimensions are relative to the x and y axes or the length and width of the image. So 100 pixels by 100 pixels produces a better image than 10 by 10 pixels. So the more pixels per inch, the greater the resolution 
and the better the print quality. And, it all, and the pixels really come down to the print quality, how we see things in the displayed, um, in display, either uh, on the computer or in print or on television. And when we look at megapixels, as far as our camera's concerned, we see that one megapixel equals one million pixels. This is important to keep in mind when we're thinking about capturing images and are our images going to be taxonomically important or taxonomically informative? Um, and also to predict what size images you need to make for print or, or for larger. You don't need to make a derivative image that's 57 inches by 78 inches that's going to fit in a publication that's this big. So you can calculate the image size in inches based on the number of pixels and the length and the width. So based on an 11 by 17 inch specimen sheet and a monitor that will look at it that has 70, uh, 72 pixels per inch, we'll see that it'll produce an image that's 52 by 78 inches, which is 4.5 times bigger than the original sheet. As we increase the number of megapixels in our cameras, those, the quality and the level of detail will only increase. So, does anybody have any questions about some of those terms? Does it, is it all review? Yeah, what friends is? Oh wait, hold on, hold on. I forgot. Thank you. Yeah, I want to just know more about the mega puzzles. Is it a normal, is it normal or is it right that the more the mega puzzles, the more brighter or the more the resolution is clearer? Usually. So he asks, is the number of megapixels directly related to the clearer the image? So if we go back to If we go back to here, for example, if in this same space, this same space, we had one million pixels by one million pixels, and this was a, a curved R, it would be sharper. But we also have to keep in mind that um, image, sen image sensors have different degrees of sensitivity, so the number of color channels on a sensor can vary too. So. Um, you want to pay attention to that too. Usually it implies that it will offer a better resolution. Sometimes you, it doesn't, you don't need resolution beyond a certain point, at least for everyday use. For our archival purposes, we want to try and aim for, we want to try and aim for higher number of megapixels for the camera we're using to capture our specimen images. And I'll go through all the equipment that we hope to, um, hope to use when capturing the images and we'll talk about that then. <coughs> yes, Samuel. Uh, how many types of camera are there for use? Because in, in, early, in early days photography, <coughs> they had what they called uh, twin lens Cigarette camera. Yes. Twinless camera. Yes. And uh, since someone might not have done photography, yes. it would be very hard to know when your camera has parallax or uh -huh. like lens separation. Uh -huh. Do we have a camera that's um, synchronized? All these, all these parameters. So that when when there is parallax. I'm yeah. Tell you all. That's an interesting point I didn't talk about. So all of those settings we can manipulate on our own, which we do in a manual setting. But then the cameras nowadays are very smart. So the auto settings, when you have the camera set to autofocus or auto exposure, auto ISO, it will read the conditions of your situation and adjust those settings for you. So when we're when we're capturing um, pictures of specimens and we're using a camera that allows us to operate in a manual mode, we choose to operate in a manual mode and control those. I don't want the camera to decide for me. 
with regard to the lenses and the type of camera to use. We'll talk about that um, in the next section when we talk about hardware and software. And we can talk about ideal cameras for what we're trying to do and maybe less than ideal or satisfactory but not ideal cameras. Um, so we'll talk about equipment now. It's a great question though. Come on. <clears throat> okay. So what are all of the pieces of equipment we need in order to have a functioning imaging station? to be able to capture specimen images. And this doesn't matter if it's an insect specimen imaging station or an herbarium specimen imaging station. We need a camera, something to capture the image. We need a lens to focus the image on the camera sensor. We need something to hold the camera above or beside the specimen. We need a light source and one that's uh, continuous and controllable or predictable. And we need a computer to save all of the images that we're generating. We need cables to connect the camera to the computer and the camera to power because we don't want to run on battery. We'll take many, many more pictures than our battery can sustain. <coughs> and we want to think about image storage space. So our computer hard drive alone won't be enough. So Samuel asked about different types of cameras and he mentioned single lens reflex. Single lens reflex refers to film photography in which what one would see through the viewfinder was exactly what the lens was seeing. There's a mirror in the back so you get to see exactly what the shutter or what the uh, image sensor is capturing. So in digital form we have what we call a digital single lens reflex which you'll often see much more as DSLR. When we're capturing specimen images, at least for herbarium specimen images, we want to aim for 18 megapixels or higher. They go as high as 36. Obviously, the higher the number of megapixels, the more expensive the, the camera, so you have to, to weigh some of those uh, considerations. Another thing that's really important with regard to the quality of the image we capture is the size of the image sensor. We want a full frame image sensor. Uh, image sensor sensor and we want our camera to capture a specific type of file format. We want it to capture raw which um, the way it saves the data, the information is uncompressed. It is uh, in its truest form which allows the greatest flexibility with editing. So raw is the highest quality image. Next under that would be a TIFF which is some compression, and a JPEG, which has much more compression. And we'll talk about those. Um, but these are the qualities we want to aim for when we're looking for a camera. These are obviously two major name brand cameras, very expensive. If you can ask for that, if you can find a way to get that, try. There's no reason to not reach for the stars, because you might be surprised someone will, will grant your wish. And if you don't, if they don't, then maybe they'll come close. <coughs>